you get like five seconds of hot pulsing techno music when you come up on the stage. It's great. Um, hello, everyone. This is After Death. My name is Sam Fippin. I'm a member of the RSpec core team and a architect and interim manager at DigitalOcean. Let's get started. If you've worked in software engineering for any time at all, you'll have heard tales of eventually encountering something that looks like this, or this, or where the service is trying and trying and trying, and then you do a deploy, and it gives up the ghost. Earlier today, not one hour ago, this status page went up on Digital Ocean, and there was a non-zero likelihood that I would be doing incident response right now instead of being on this stage, which is fun. It happens. The things we build fail, it's inevitable. The systems that we work on aren't perfect and neither are the people. And if you hold a pager for any production system, I'm sure you know the feeling of sadness and frustration and what's going on? Hmm. Clicker's doing two inputs at once. And, for, uh, and anger at being woken up at three o'clock in the morning. Why did my team not care enough to not make that bad deploy? Why is my company not protecting me from failing infrastructure, what on earth has gone wrong? As I mentioned, I'm a manager now, and I have a covenant with my people that says that this will be as rare as possible and that I will empower them to prevent it from happening as often as we possibly can. And the thing about DigitalOcean is it's not a Rails monolith. It's a big, complicated services world. And I can tell you from experience that those services contribute just as much to the downtime uh, as any like other factor that we have in our infrastructure. And this happens, right? There's really nothing we can do about it. No matter how hard we try, computers will break. The disks on your servers will fill up. A human will write a bug and play it to production. And well, in the worst case, the underlying hardware literally catches fire. So what can we do about this? What tools do we have at our disposal to make sure that as often as possible, we are not being affected by these incidents, that we're getting better? And Jess spoke to this very eloquently this morning, and I'd, I'd like to sort of throw my ring in the hat. Many of us, when these things happen, do a post-incident review or a learning review or something else. But the truth of the matter is, at DigitalOcean, we call them post-mortems, and I like this metal font, so. That's, that's what we're doing. And the thing about doing these reviews is that it gives us a literal system from learning from the failures that we undergo. And with that system, we're able to really patch up and find underlying causes and fix them. We're able to work with our organizations to understand what risks we might be accepting when we build the systems that we work on. Everyone here who has the ability to deploy to their production environment is accepting a risk every single time they do it, but we're all asked to ship features basically as quickly as we can. And while that's a really valuable and important thing, it's important to note that ultimately, if your product's not available, you can't have any customers. And so this is a thing that they care about too. And by no means am I here to tell you that I think I have all the answers. I used to be terrible at this. And uh, working on a cloud scale system for a couple of years has taught me a lot. Really, we only started getting good at this a year ago, and so I'm just going to share some reckons here. If you disagree, uh, feel free to have a chat with me afterwards. I love talking about this stuff. So, to talk about this, I'd actually like to dig into how we post mortem at DigitalOcean to give you some understanding of how I think about the process. And to do that, I'm actually going to walk us through DigitalOcean's post-mortem template. Every time we have any kind of severe production incident, one of these gets kicked off, and an engineer starts filling it out. We give the incident a name. Uh, we take the date of when the incident commenced. And then we assign it a severity. Severities are useful because they tell you how to respond, what kind of response is necessary, and who should be involved. And at DigitalOcean, we have a five-point scale that starts at SEV0. A SEV0 incident at DigitalOcean means that there is a critical impact to the business that likely means that everything will end 
if engineers don't work quickly to fix it. These are the company-ending events that you all dread. Unfortunately, they're incredibly rare. I think we've had two since the scale was defined. But in a Cev0 incident, every engineer in the company, multiple directors, infrastructure people, a coordinating response, literally everyone bands together to try and make the problem go away. It's the worst thing that can happen, and so it gets the highest form of response as a result. A Cev1 is a major global outage or an entire single product not functioning. If a data center is gone, that's a Cev1. And again, at this point, we get executives involved. There are usually multiple teams coordinating, but we don't believe the business is going to end if we don't deal with it immediately, and that's sort of the core distinction. Sev2 is the lowest severity of incident that we wake people up in the middle of the night for, and that's basically when a single product has stopped working or something else has gone wrong that's severe, but not severe enough to wake everyone up. Usually there's one engineer here doing response, coordinating with our support and communications teams. And then we have three and four, which are basically just bugs and defects that go into JIRA and get fixed at some point in the future, hopefully. If your organization doesn't yet have a mature incident response practice, having a severity scale is a really good place to start. It allows you to communicate with your company about what the incident classes that you have actually are, how bad they are, and what you can do to fix them, who needs to be involved, what the procedures should be, and that sort of thing. This is pretty standard across all incident response practice, and so this is a really good thing that you can add to your tools if you don't have one already. The next thing that I want to focus on in our postmortem is the timeline. And the timeline is really one of the most core and critical pieces of these documents. It's the facts of everything that happened that caused the incident to occur from the very beginning to the very end. Everyone who was involved, all of the systems that went wrong, logging, monitoring, and those sorts of things. But there are a couple of rules. Timelines must be hard facts. You shouldn't include any analysis or emotion. What people did is valid. How you thought about what you were doing is not. This is entirely just to get an understanding of what happened. The sort of pro tip that I have here is if you're dealing with an incident like this, you should complete your timeline as close to the incident as possible. And the reason for that is that logs rotate out, graphs expire, me memories get fuzzy, and so depending on how severe your incident is, we typically either complete this as soon as response is done or the next morning afterwards. Uh, to steal a line from Jess, document everything. No matter how small, what the thing may seem, it may actually be a critical underpinning of a later piece of analysis. And so the timeline is a really valuable tool. This is what a typical incident timeline looks like. It includes timestamps. We use UTC. Some people use their local time zone. That's up to you. And this is kind of a straw time timeline. This is not a real incident timeline, because if I told you what we did in real incidents, that might be problematic, and you might want to stop using us. Um, <laughs> This first line here is a deploy was made which introduced a bug. And here I'm really trying to make the point that your incident starts before you notice it. A deploy happens, a server fails, a database row gets corrupted. And at that point, no human has actually noticed that something has gone wrong, but something has gone wrong. And so when we think about incident response, we need to document when our incident actually started, which is a separate point to when we notice and when incident response begins. Next line is saying that our graphs indicate something went wrong, and you'll see here I have a, like a little one Wikipedia like citation mark. In all of these lines, you should add some kind of evidence that explains what the um, that explains how this timeline was created. Be it a screenshot of a graph, a screenshot of logs, a link to a Slack line, a link to page duty. That's all really good. And again, remember, log systems and graph systems expire. Make sure you capture it permanently. The other piece of advice that I have here is observability is really good and you should have some. The Rails community as a whole I think is not great at building good observable services and thinking about what you can do to add graphs, metrics, logs to your system is a really good idea. At DigitalOcean, we make very heavy use of Prometheus and Grafana, but if you're hosting on Heroku, uh, they actually have a really great dashboard built in, and this is probably good enough for most smaller Rails applications. 
This is really important. The actual impact of your incident, what happened, how many customers, how many tickets, what data was lost, can usually be reconstructed from this information. And so thinking carefully about the observability is useful both for incident response and is just a generally healthy thing for you to do as well as helping you fill out your post-mortems. Uh, the next line you'll see is that Sam got paged for BizOps internal tools, which is the name of my team at DigitalOcean, with a link out to PagerDuty. And PagerDuty is great if you have another paging system, that's cool, I, but I'm really only familiar with PagerDuty. And here you'll see this is what a PagerDuty incident looks like. And the thing we're trying to capture with this line is when did we actually get a human involved? And that's really important because that's the earliest point in your incident that you could possibly begin clearing it up if it's bad enough that it's not gonna heal itself. And so documenting not just when the incident started and when we first noticed it, but also when response began, begins to inform on a wider basis how we're dealing with incidents that occur at our company. Another factor that's really important is who alerted this person? At DigitalOcean, we're fortunate enough to have a 24 by seven support and operations team uh, that can wake us up in the middle of the night and is able to make technical investigations. If you don't have that, you need to have some kind of machine alerting. And a thing that we have generally observed is that if a machine alerts us, um, our incident uh, closure time is much faster than if a human alerts us. And so having automated alerts is a generally healthy operations practice and is something that you can build once you've got that observability in your application. <laughs> so we then come to our next timeline, which is the human acknowledging the page. And that's another sort of useful and important point because that's when this person that we reached out to actually began responding. If you're paging someone at three o'clock in the morning and they're in deep sleep, it might take them 40, 50 minutes to actually wake up and realize what is going on. But understanding that time and that factor is really important. But as well as this, uh, in our timelines where we have multiple responders, we document where everyone got pulled in and what they were doing. And so the idea here is that um, this part of the timeline really scales to everyone that is involved in incident response and should document who was involved and is doing what. There's one thing that I have here as a super mega pro tip, and that's announcing presence in Slack. If you're doing incident response, make sure people know you're doing incident response. What you're doing, why you're doing it, when you're doing it, and communicating frequently. As a general rule, I ask primary incident responders that I work with to update in Slack at least once every five minutes with exactly what they're doing. And that's not to sort of micromanage and continuously check in on them, but that's sort of as a heartbeat to make sure that we're still fighting the incident, even if they don't have a status update. It's just useful and healthy good practice. And then finally, you have whatever you do to fix, links to GitHub or whatever it might be, and uh, graphs that show resolution. And here we're really asking the question, how did we fix it? Can we prove that we fixed it? Do we have confirmation of that? So that's our timeline. And that may all seem fairly obvious, but getting that documentation exactly correct is really, really valuable. And if you have this ongoing log of everything that happened in all of your incident response, you as an engineer will be able to build up patterns of what happened, why it happened, and how your team is fixing things. So let's move on to the next section, and this is the single most important part of every one of these postmortems and learning reviews, the root cause section. Now, the thing about the term root cause is, is that it's inherently misleading. It implies that it's singular, and it also implies that it's the closest thing to the incident. That's how most people I see naively fill these out, and I'm guilty of having done this in the past myself. This is one of the earliest root causes I wrote at DigitalOcean, and I absolutely don't expect you to read all of this text. You basically need to get the idea that a deploy happened, bad queries, too much scale, and there was a sort of outdated deploy load. This caused the incident. I deployed something, there was too much scale, stuff went wrong. That seems perfectly reasonable at a first glance, but this doesn't actually help us solve any problem. And to think about how we can, let's dig into exactly what's written there a little bit more. There was an Atlantis deployment with a scaling factor of 10 where each instance had a default worker thread of 25. Select statements being issued to prod MySQL 1A. Um, didn't have an index in place. 
an outdated version of the worker. These four things are what should actually be called proximate causes. These are all close to the incident that happened, but not actually causal if you really, really dig. And so let's do a real root cause analysis on these four factors and have a better understanding of what is really going on. To start with, let's take a look at the select statements to prod my SQL 1A. Quote, to understand this, you need to understand a little bit about how database architecture works at DigitalOcean. We have one ginormous MySQL cluster uh, called Alpha, and it's made up of a bunch of servers. MySQL 1A is the primary and accepts reads and writes, and all the other ones are read replicas. They only accept read queries. And the point of doing this is that we can alleviate traffic from our primary by moving those queries onto the followers. And it's a generally established best practice that if you know a transaction is only going to issue selects, to use a, a follower instead of the primary database. If I was going to write this today, I would probably say that Atlantis was issuing unnecessary reads to the production primary, but also leave a training note that says words to the effect that we should be careful to ensure to use the read replicas wherever possible. This reinforces that best practice and also creates documentation for other people to follow going forward as a way to avoid this problem. We had this thing about uh, issuing queries that didn't have an index, and this should be fairly self-explanatory have indexes. Database indexes are really good. They make everything faster. You almost always want to have them. And so, well, let's think about, we have this missing index, but, but a query made it all the way to production without us having any ability to detect it was going to cause a problem. You could argue absence of testing for full table scans. You could argue unrealistic testing data. You could argue, and this is a really common one, staging environment doesn't reflect production. How many of you have staging environments that you genuinely believe are a good reflection of your production environment? That can be one of the most useful silver bullets against operational failure. Try building one. It's a really hard problem. <sighs> Running an outdated version of the worker may have contributed to load. Um, complex production environments when you run the internet are hard. Um, basically, we used to have this production environment uh, where these servers, their sidekick workers, were deployed with Chef and Capistrano, and there were four of them. Then, the great Kubernetes migration of 2016 came along, and we dockerized everything, and then we deployed uh, 10, 10 of these pods uh, to our new shiny Kubernetes environment. The problem is, we didn't burn these Chef nodes initially because we were worried Kubernetes wasn't going to work, and the deploys weren't in sync. So we had like old revisions of the software in production at the same time as new revisions of the software, and like that was a nightmare. Don't, don't do it. It's a really bad idea. I would note this and root cause it now as um, running parallel Chef and Kubernetes environments exacerbated the load problem, lack of procedure around decommissioning uh, Chef nodes, um, and in general, having a little bit more maturity around thinking about big, complex production transitions like that, which is not something that many of the people involved were experienced at doing at the time. And then finally, this like scaling factor one. Um, this is really tricky, because the truth of the matter is, if those other three things hadn't gone wrong, this wouldn't have been a problem. And so here we have a really good example of like, uh, an exacerbating factor that if we'd fixed all of our other problems, wouldn't even have been exposed. But it's worth looking here. We didn't have a great reason to scale this application up. It was just like, Kubernetes, infinite scale, hooray! Oh no, production's on fire. So I might just note a sort of training procedure issue about when you change scale of production applications and, and move on. So let's talk about the kind of thinking that we did there, because it's a very specific kind of thinking. We're not looking at what directly close to this incident caused it. We're asking the questions, what in our system made this incident possible? The way I phrase this to newer developers is look for procedural policy systems and training problems that are affecting your organization and macro ways that you can fix them. It's never ever a single person doing a bad thing that causes a major production incident like this. Not one time. Everyone that you work with is trying really hard and assumingly, that's not a word, <laughs> is doing their best. Um, and so I always ask questions, well, given that this person was trying as hard as they could, 
what safeguards were missing? Why didn't they know that this was a dangerous operation to do? It's, it's never a person, it's always a system, and I, I'm just gonna shamelessly directly quote Jess from this morning. If you show me a team that punishes people that make mistakes, I'll show you a team that makes a lot of mistakes. I think that's really true, and it's like sort of the perfect summary uh, of my talk. Um, this takes time. Getting really good at postmortems, getting really good at healing the problems in your organization that cause these issues to occur takes time and practice and care and attention. The truth of the matter is when I look at the people who write postmortems around me, the ones that produce the best ones are the people who give the most of a damn about working with their colleagues. The ones who have empathy with everyone that they work with and the ones who understand the pain of not being able to sleep through the night because the computers aren't working. So that's most of what I got. Um, if you want to steal our postmortem template, I will be sharing it on the internet because that seems like a good thing to do. Um, I am hiring literally for my team, so if you want to work with exactly me, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a thing that's happening. Um, that's, yeah, I, that's the least shilly way I could possibly try and hire you is if you like me, come work with me. Um, that's all I got, thank you.